What's going on guys? Had to do that intro for my coworker. Welcome back everyone. This should be our last video in the videos of all videos. And what we're going to do is we're going to export our maps from Substance Painter. And then we're going to boot up the old Marmoset tool bag and then um, import our uh, model as well as our two texture sets. And then um, I'll go through some basic uh, Marmoset, you know, rendering techniques. And also I'll point you to a really useful video. Um, that actually helped me a lot uh, with coming up with um, professional looking renders for games and after that uh, I will show you an example of what I did um, to cap this off into a model sheet and um, that'll be in Photoshop so let's jump right into it after I take a drink That's um, vodka mixed with lemonade. It's very sweet. Okay, here we are. Um, so we are happy with how this looks in Substance Painter. However, we, unite, we might not be happy with how this looks in Marmoset, and that's okay because uh, all this stuff is still subject to change, and we will tweak it on the fly. Uh, so... First thing I'm going to do is let's just export our texture set. We already have our canopy textures, so I'm not going to export those. But we need our trunk textures. So um, let's go up to here to File and then Export Textures. Uh, you can see here that for each texture set, you can uncheck. So um, from the last video, we set this export setting to be the bake maps, and these are not the maps that we need, so I'm going to change this to the, uh, it's up here in configuration, no, it's not, it's up here in config, and I'm going to change this to PBR Metal Rough, and I am pretty sure this is the default setting. So uh, that was, that's going to give us our base color, roughness, Metallic, normal, height, and emissive. We don't really need height or emissive uh, for this particular model. We may need height. Um, we'll experiment with it in design or uh, Marmoset, but these are actually even normal roughness and base color. Those are the top three. We also need ambience occlusion, um, but let's just export these for now. So let's choose a location and I'm going to just go into here and make a new folder and I'm going to call it maps from substance painter. Cool. Let's select that folder and let's just hit export. Um, actually, so no, you know what? That's fine. Uh, I was going to kind of explain padding. Um, and the di dilation, uh, dilation settings, it's, um, essentially these, these, uh, you can set a setting in Substance Painter that will allow you to, it will not give you any type of pixel bleed. And so what it does is it takes the color of each outside pixel and then it kind of stretches it to um, the maximum amount so that when it's applied to your geometry uh, there's no kind of like bleed marks or anything. Um, I can show you what that looks like. If we just put this as dilation infinite, uh, let's just see this really quickly. Um, Let's go to where we exported this at, this maps. So um, you can see that this is our base color. 
But like I was saying, it takes each pixel and it averages out that color and then it kind of stretches it until it hits the average length of uh, of your other UV shell. So um, generally this is good practice to use and it, you know, sometimes when you apply textures to 3D geometry, you get like this little bit of a pixel bleed and then it kind of gives you like these white little artifacts around here. But by checking dilation to be true, um, you don't need to worry about that. So this is fine. Uh, you can see here that our height map is nice and non-existent. And that's because we don't have any height information in Substance Painter right now. We also don't have any metallic. So we're left with base color, normal, and roughness. However, um, if we go back and where did I save those? Texture Sheets, PNG, uh, ch 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 Trunk Bic Maps. You can see that we have our overall ambient occlusion map here, but we do not have the ambient occlusion information for our um, tileable bark, I'm noticing. And I just want to make sure that that's correct. Uh, so we filled it. Yeah, so we do have that. Let's go up here and do export textures again one more time. Um, configuration. Okay. I need to get this ambient occlusion map. And three output maps will be exported. Uh, ambient occlusion is a gray scale. And I want to click and drag ambient occlusion to this gray scale channel and set it to be gray channel. And let's just copy this, control C, control V, and then let's erase this and call it AO. And I think this should be correct. So the input maps are ambient occlusion and we set that to be a grayscale channel. So uh, oops not do that okay let's see if we get what we need here export uh, where's that folder um, so it's maps roughness height huh okay that's no good, is it? Um, I'm not sure why it's not giving me my ambient occlusion channel. I set it to be Set it to be okay. Oh, maybe that's why <laughs> I just forgot to set it to PBR Metal Rough. Duh. Okay, I don't need a missive. Height would be nice, but I'm not getting any information out of that because um, we don't have any height information in any of these maps and that's okay because I think we're going to substitute that later on so let's just delete that height for now we don't need metallic because we know that there is no metalness so let's try this again let's create a grayscale channel let's control C control V 
And then let's call this ambient occlusion. Okay, and then we're going to drag this ambient occlusion information into this channel and then say gray channel? Question mark? Just kidding. Um, yeah. Okay. And it's still not updating. Hmm. Well, let's try this again. Mouse from Substance Painter. Yes. Okay, this is not working. Oh wait, there it is. Amy's it's occlusion. Okay. Sorry guys, I feel really silly. Um, there's our Amy's occlusion map. <clears throat> uh, I'm, as weird as it sounds, I'm more comfortable in substance designer than I am in painter at the moment. But that's okay because here's our ambient occlusion map and we're going to use that. So just to recap what I did, um, file export textures and the config right now is PBR metal rough. However, you will notice that, uh, you know, the, the default settings does not include ambient occlusion. So you go over to configuration, make sure that you select your PBR metal rough, um, export config. And then you will um, create a grayscale channel because ambient occlusion is a grayscale map. And then you're just going to drag this input map of ambient occlusion into there. And that's uh, essentially how you would export any additional maps that you need. Uh, the reason why we're not going to use our mesh map ambient occlusion is because that is only baked information that does not include the ambient occlusion of the tiling bark texture that we imported earlier in the last video. So sorry that took a while. Um, again, uh, still kind of getting to grips with these export settings. Uh, I am more used to Substance Designer. So let's now, so now we have our maps. Cool. Metallic don't need that roughness normal base color AO awesome let's boot up marmoset okay so here we are in marmoset um, I am first this is kind of your default view uh, it's pretty the the UI and the interface is pretty basic um, you have your render settings here in your default scene. You have your camera, and we will uh, we won't be touching this too much. And yet, yeah. So this will kind of give us a couple of things we might want to consider um, for our uh, final renders. But for now. Um, that's, you know, th think of the main camera almost like a post-process volume, I guess. E even though you can still control, like, aperture and depth of field and stuff like that. That's really useful, obviously. Um, but the way we're going to be using it is almost for, almost acts as, like, a post-process type of thing. And then we have our sky, which is going to be our um, main light source. And we might import a couple of light sources, additional light sources, just to kind of give ourselves a more interesting lighting scenario. But for now, um, those are the three things in our default scene. And now let's um, first, I'm going to go back to our 3ds Max scene here. Um, so you'll see that we have our low poly guy here. I also made this really simple base um, just to give give our uh, our renders a little bit more context. Um, we're essentially doing asset renders. We're not going to be rendering these in full environments, at least not in this tutorial. 
So um, I figured that what I'm going to do here is just kind of almost like a, you know, you guys can shape this however you want, but for now it's just like a really simple disc shape. And I'm just going to map like a, um, a kind of a muddy uh, twig, rocky texture onto this guy. And that's just going to, you know, kind of make it so that our asset doesn't look like it's floating off in space because that looks generally kind of looks kind of weird. But all right, so we have our FBX already of this guy. Um, let's export this one as well. I already have it zeroed it out, so let's go to File, Export, Selected. And let's go to our, our doodad. And then let's call this um, Ponytail Palm Dirt Mound underscore MDL. Save that. Yes, yes, yes. Moving groups. That's fine. Cool. Okay. Um, let's jump back into Marmoset. Let's import our meshes. So let's go to File, Import Model. And I'm going to select my FBX of my well poly, which is that. Okay. So you'll see that Marmoset read um, both of our material IDs and it always keeps this kind of default uh, material here so um, we'll get rid of that later but the important thing is that we have our ponytail palm canopy and trunk ID maps so what we're going to do is essentially plug our maps into here if we need to make adjustments we will do that but let's just see how it's looking first um, Okay, so we have this model imported in. Let's also import our dirt mound. And here we go. It's nice and centered. Sweet. Um, so let's get busy building up these materials first before we even think about rendering anything. Um, so this one is the canopy. So... All I'm going to do, also I forgot to mention, just basic kind of controls if you've never used Marmoset before. Alt and, and left click and hold is to orbit. Uh, mouse wheel is to zoom in and out. And then, what is it, shift? No, alt, alt middle mouse is to um, pan. So pretty, uh, pretty similar to Max, actually. Anyway, um... Let's start importing our maps. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our normal map. So let's click this guy and then let's navigate to our canopy normal map. So texture sheets, PNG, canopy, normal right there. And you can't see anything yet, but it's, it's there, I promise. Uh, gloss map. So, gloss, that's going to be our roughness, and let's click that and select our roughness, and um, you can control the overall amount of, of your quote-unquote gloss. Uh, the difference between gloss and roughness maps is that the grayscale um, values are inverted. So by default, it's set to gloss. So I'm going to click invert for, uh, for this texture because we mapped it to be a roughness map. We created it to be a roughness map. And then also what I'm going to do really quick just to get a better view of this is I'm going to go to my sky. And let's go to presets. Um... Let's set it to let's set it to like hedge right now just so I can get a better view. Um, and so you can see that with my gloss set to invert 
and it's all the way at one, that basically means it's it's giving us our maximum value according to the map that's been plugged into this slot. So if your roughness map is correct, then you're going to want to click invert and then hit one for your gloss. And we can always tweak this stuff, which is the cool thing about Marmoset. Uh, let's leave that for now. And then let's plug in our albedo map. That's going to be our base color right there. Let's open that up. Cool, cool. You'll see that everything is super crazy shiny right now. And that's okay because we're not going to be seeing it. So um, we can we can mess, mess with diffusion and reflectivity. Um, you can see that essentially it's this would be your metallic metalness um, we're gonna just leave that at zero and then uh, here is a so down here under reflection there's a slot for occlusion this is where you're going to set your ambient occlusion so let's click that and then grab our ambient occlusion and it updates like so don't have a cavity map and then um, this is where our alpha is going to be so let's hit alpha and let's bring in our opacity map and you'll see that nothing happens and that's because we need to switch the channel determines which channel of the texture will be used in the transparency map let's switch this to B so you can see uh, pretty quickly our maps have uh, been populated for our canopy. And I'm also noticing that it is single-sided. And what are you going to do about that, Craig? Well, I'll tell you. Um, let's go over here into our scene hierarchy. And then let's click our model. And you can see that once we click our model, there's this little checkbox called Cull Back Faces. And we're going to just turn that off because we want, we want our canopy to be two-sided. It gives us that density, and it makes us happy. <laughs> so um, that's looking, it's looking pretty good. I'm just kind of checking our roughness here. And that looks that looks to be correct. I might kind of like tweak that down a little bit. Cool. So um, for the most part, our canopy material is good to go. Um, we're not going to mess with any of these texture tiling nodes here because this has been mapped to a one-to-one -one texture space. And if you made this tile, it would look not correct. But just to demonstrate, look at that. Little spiders just flying around. Yeah, so we don't want that. Let's leave that at one. Okay, uh, let's move on to our trunk. So this is going to be the same deal. Let's import a normal map. Let's go to... Um, maps from substance painter let's grab our normal map cool look at that it auto updates for us and that looks pretty pretty okay <laughs> also i'm going to bring this down a bit i know that we said we were going to fix this at one point and we never did but you guys should fix it and i will fix it just not at this exact moment in time Anywho, um, you also have the option of uh, flipping red channels and green channels and all that, and that just kind of depends on what what uh, format you exported your normal maps to be. Um, we are going to flip the Y 
because we baked it out to be DirectX format. And that's the uh, format. OpenGL is uh, Unity's native normal map format, and DirectX is Unreal's. So um, just uh, play with these switches on your... Um, in fact, we should probably do that for our canopy. Let me just make sure. Yeah. So essentially, you know. You see uh, what it's doing. Anyways, let's go back. I digress. Um, let's bring in our roughness. So I'm going to hit invert. And then let's bring our gloss all the way up. And let's assign our roughness map. So this should be correct. Um, this is similar to Substance Painter where you hold shift and right click and then you can rotate the environment around. I'm just making sure that we have our roughness correct. Looks Yeah, no, yeah, so one should be correct. Cool. Okay. Just a sanity check, guys. It's good good to do those every once in a while. Uh Albedo. Let's bring in let's bring in our base color. Okay. <laughs> it is quite dark. Um and that could be for a number of reasons. We're not going to trip about that too hard yet because I just want to get everything plugged in first. Um, that darkness, there's a lot of factors happening here. It's lighting, it's the texture itself, it's reflectivity, it's uh, roughness values. There's a lot of stuff going on here. But um, we're going to fix that later on. So. Don't freak out too much if it doesn't look exactly how you imagined it. Let's leave specularity alone. Um, let's bring in our ambient occlusion. From the old ambient occlusion. And that's going to make it even darker naturally because, you know, we're bringing in a uh, shadow definition essentially. Uh, but that's okay. Cavity map, we don't... Actually, I think we did bake a cavity map, did we not? Or I know we baked a curvature map. PNG bake maps. So we have a curvature map. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that alone for now. Um and then we do not have any transparency, so for now all of our maps are have been inputted. Um correctly. Now uh, we do have uh, a slot up here for displacement and essentially that can run on a height map. However you will recall we actually don't have any height map baked information um, and that uh, if you're if we're trying to go for like a really high quality rendering essentially what's going to happen when we input a height map is we're going to end up you know breaking apart these uh really kind of hard edges that we're getting here right now and that's just going to help us in the long run so i think it would be worth uh quickly generating a height map and um we can do that in painter but we can also do it in designer and um, I think I'm going to do it in designer because there is literally a one button fix to generate a height map um, and we just kind of have to we just kind of have to mess with it a little bit so let's uh, Let's do that. Let's go to new substance and let's just call this height example. And let's press OK. 
And then we can actually kill two birds with one stone um, while we're in here. I'm going to throw in a quick base material node. And then I'm going to double click that. And I'm going to just kind of apply my, uh, sorry, user defined maps. That's what I wanted. Um, okay, so we are working with user defined maps because we bake these out of Substance Painter. So we bake the base color, which is our albedo. We bake the normal map. We bake the roughness, a roughness map as well as a ambient occlusion map. So let's import those guys really quickly. Roughness, AO, normal, base color, import, press OK. Cool. Let's quickly throw these guys into our respected outputs. Um, Substance Designer will natively, actually, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, when you import bitmaps to Designer, um, usually, if they're meant to be grayscale, they're usually not, but all you have to do is just come over here and set this to be grayscale. So that would be our roughness map and our ambient occlusion map. Uh, so the way you can tell also is that the uh, little node on the on the right side here is orange, and that pretty much just means that it's a color map. So the only color information we're going to need is our base color and our normal. Everything else should be um, should be grayscale maps. Okay, this is our roughness map. Sometimes this takes a little bit of time because these are 2K maps, so it takes a while to. Um, To preview this stuff let's uh so all this stuff is plugged in ao roughness normal let's uh view this in 3d cool that's fine um okay so let's generate a quick height map uh there's a really useful node here it's called normal to height let's um essentially what it does is it takes your normal information and it outputs a height map so Let's plug that in. Let's just see what this looks like in Marmoset. And you can mess with low frequency, mid frequency, high frequencies. Essentially, the slider, you know, you can kind of play with this stuff a little bit. I don't like to have a lot of high frequency height map detail. Although I did read somewhere that the uh, sharper edges you have on a height map, the obviously more defined you'll have. Um, we kind of just want this to be a little subtle. So I think like the default settings are going to be just fine. Just to try at least. Let's just see what this does. So I double click this and then I'm going to hit save as bitmap. And then let's put it in... Um, Let's lie and put in maps from Substance Painter. Let's call this underscore height. Let's save that. Let's jump back into Marmoset. And we're nearing the point where this, uh, <laughs> this, this albedo color is actually just going to be distracting. It's way too dark especially in this lighting scenario. Um, one thing you can do is obviously brighten up your scene, but um, typically if you're... Uh, the one thing I like to kind of think of is when you bring in things and by default they look way too dark, it's probably because they're too dark. So... Let's let's do this. Let's jump back into Designer. So the cool thing we can do here is we can go to um, 
press spacebar and type in HSL and that stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. And what we can do is plug that input of our uh, base color in. And then we can just up this lightness just a little bit, like so. And let's just see how that looks. So let's save that. Let's, uh, let's overwrite our base color and it should automatically update in Marmoset. So if I jump back in, and you'll see that it did it did update. Uh, it's still very very dark. Um, so I'm thinking. I'm again. I'm holding Shift, and right click to kind of rotate around. Maybe let's try a different lighting scenario. Let's go to sky. This forest path. I mean, this is a foliage asset. I don't really like that. It's kind of too green. So you can see by quickly changing the presets here we can start to start to get a lighting scenario that would work best for us. And I'm thinking just cycling through these that um, I don't know. Um, I mean, logically, if you were rendering this to be a foliage asset, it would make sense to do forest path. But it has all that that kind of green tint to it. And I don't want it to wash out all the work we did with our color maps. So, maybe overcast hillside. The other cool thing too is you can actually um, save your own and import your own sky, HDRI skies. So there's always that. Let's bump up this brightness a tad. Uh, sure, let's try that a bit. I mean, the important thing is that we're now starting to see this detail that we worked on for this uh, particular tree. So that's always good. <laughs> um, let's uh, up that lightness just a little bit more. Maybe, maybe that. Let's overwrite again, and then, okay, that's starting to look a little bit better. Yeah, okay. Um, now, let's, uh, let's import our displacement map. That's gonna be generating our height detail onto this trunk and the experience I've had doing this in Marmoset is uh, to keep these values very very low and you'll see why in a second so let's just go here and let's go to where do we save that maps from substance painter let's plug in our height and see what happens you can see that that looks great. Fantastic. Just kidding, that looks horrible. Uh, and the reason why, first of all, is that this scale is set to one. And you can see under my mouse it says, sets the intensity of the displacement effect. So if it's all the way to one, that's the maximum effect that this, this uh, material, this texture input is reading based off of the black and white values of our height map. So let's pull this down quite a bit. And I'm only going to pull it down maybe to 0 0.02. And you can see here that we're starting to get a little bit of a, a UV bleed as well. Um, let's address that in a second. However, 
you can see that based off of the values of our black and white map for our height, it's going to be pushing and pulling um, values. So, for example, for every purest black value, it will pull the texture, it will displace the pixels negatively. So black is down, white is up. Right? And this is how a lot of uh, environment artists build um, terrains. So they will generate a height map and kind of plug that in to the engine and then the engine will interpolate this data based off of the black and white values. Um, fun little fact. So the way we can make this look not as horrendous is um, we can actually up this subdivision amount and we can set this to PN triangles. And this tessellation amount, it, you can see right here, it says sets the level of tessellation or geometry limit for subdivision. So if we bump that all the way up, you can see that it gets, it's still quite noisy, but we're now getting a little bit more definition based off of those values in our height map. And then um, what we can do now is we can pull this scale down more. And sometimes I just like to mess with these settings just to see what they do. Um, what was it? 0.5. So you can see that we're getting these kind of mesh holes where, um, <laughs> where we cut these UVs, and that's because essentially this this texture is a one-to-one -one texture and it's not tileable. Uh, so there's there's a couple of things that we could do to avoid that one of them is to import our high poly model and just do it that way however you'll you'll remember that our high poly model doesn't have any uvs so that is not going to work Um, and the, the other, <laughs> the other solution here would be, uh, we change our UVs around. We put them in places that are hidden from view in our renders. And that, uh, I'm not going to do that because that is just way too much to go back and do that. That's probably something I should have thought about um, as I was prepping this. So I apologize for that. Um, however... However, uh, you know, another thing we can do also is just we don't, you know, we don't need a, a height map. We just turn it off. It's, it's kind of up to you guys. Uh, I think the height map adds a lot of our, our, our information that we were trying to get through these, these renders. And once we put a texture down on our kind of base dirt mound here, it, we're not really going to see these these breaks. And um, you know, just kind of finding the the correct amount to offset your 
texture. Like, see, even even I think this is too much. So like, it's it's got to be just ever so slightly. And if it's ever so slightly, then you know we're not gonna notice these cracks. So let's just for now let's leave that. Maybe just a little bit down, something like that. I'm just trying to get like these these little breakups here. So, anyway, um, cool. That's uh, that's all of our maps, I think. Yeah, we can also change um, how our albedo is getting rendered. We can change the color here, but you're not going to want to do that. Uh, you can also change the um, the lighting mode of your diffuse. Um, you can see that it it does a, a fuzz map. There you go, fuzz map. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at Lambert. That's typically what I do. Okay. Um, so last but not least is I am going to add a texture to my base. Um, this is kind of slightly temporary. I, I might keep it, I might not, but, uh, I built a substance graph and it was, it was kind of perfect for this mossy ground. So, um, I'll give you the guys, the textures for that as well, because I'm just, I'm just a nice guy. <laughs> um, so let's do that let's find the wherever the heck it was that i saved those um i think it was in texture sheets i might need to go into my graph again and that's no good is it let's open it Where did I put it? You know what? I think I saved it with my other plants. Shrug, 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 tree, tree, tree. Sorry, guys. Um, Photoshop progress shots. Tree small. Where is it at? It's not here. Cool. Um, dirt ground. Yeah. Substance Academy. Here it is. Look at that. That's a good one. Uh, this was actually done through that Substance Academy tutorial. Really, really good. Um, if you guys want to go through this and understand as much as you can about Substance Designer, highly recommend it. Let's save these guys. Um, let's call this PNG. And then let's call it... Uh, no, nope, not there. Texture sheets. Yeah, gosh dang it. I am not on my game today. Okay, uh, dirt mound. And then let's call this dirt mound underscore text base color. Let's call this um, normal. One of my friends at work was asking me um, 
because we were talking about me making these tutorials. And she was asking me, uh, you know, what kind of, well, because I was asking her for my, her, her, her opinion, like, you know, I've been saying all these all this time that I'm I'm leaving this stuff in there because I personally I personally like to see the entire process of how how that particular artist got to that conclusion. And she was like, Yeah, that makes totally makes sense. And um and she's like, you know, the thing about it is you're not gonna please everyone. And I'm just like, yeah, you're right. I'm not. Um, I was always, you know, when I watched these tutorials, uh, I was always the kind to sit through and watch every second of it and just try to analyze what, like, what's what's their thought process? What what are they thinking? Like, why? Why is, uh, oops, why is, um, why are they making these choices? And so if I, if you guys do not like this type of approach, then this tutorial series is not for you. Um, you know, but I, I think... I think I'm just going to try this series out and make it how I would want to see a tutorial and just see how it goes. I don't have it transparency or emissive. Okay. Um, so you can see here that I plugged in those uh, dirt maps. I'll add those textures for you guys if you want. Or of course you want. <laughs> but I'll, I'll add them for you. And... Um, Let's, so, uh, before we were talking about this texture tiling, this, this would be a time where we would tile this texture because it was created in Substance Designer and naturally those are tiling textures. So if, you know, this scale isn't quite matching our tree, let's tile it like three times. That, that looks a little bit better. You know, um, I don't particularly like how the color is not really matching with the tree because that doesn't seem very realistic. Um, I'm also going to maybe take this tiling down a little bit. It's still maybe like 2.5. Mm, mm, 2.25. Let's go with that for now. So... I want to kind of do my best to match these val these color values, um, and again, one one way we can do that is through, um, well, you know, since we're here, let's see if we can just bring this value down a little bit. So we don't want to do this because it's just going to essentially make our texture gray. So let's jump back into designer and then let's uh, where's my base color final base color is here material color blend so let's do this let's go HSL and then let's plug this guy into here and let's bring this lightness down just a tad right there uh, let's save that over okay so what this tells me is that Something is going on with our lighting. Um, yeah, we we just do not have the right values in here. Uh, 
maybe yeah it's still like super bright I mean that's a little closer and what this becomes is like just splitting the difference a little bit um tell you what let's do this let's go back into designer uh let's import our trunk and then so it's kind of weird because in Marmoset, our trunk actually looks darker than our dirt, but in Designer, our trunk looks lighter than our dirt. So, what are we going to do about that? Um, that's bizarre. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Can always input a height map. That's not going to help with our color, though. But um, that looks pretty good. Let's bump up the tessellation, and then let's pump that scale down a little bit. So this is like a pretty good example of what tessellation can do and what uh, height map information you can get through this kind of stuff. Um, I'm still not happy with this this like this completely discolored um, thing here. So one thing that we can do or yeah overcast bump this brightness up slightly. One thing we can do is uh, let's try making our our dirt darker first. So uh, base color save yes. Hmm. So that does not seem to be doing anything. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a way to um, just like match this color, and it is not wanting to do that. And I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. Man, this is, looks so bright. And when I go back into Designer, it's completely dark. And um, my technical director at work would always tell me, if you're changing... If you're changing your albedo map to match something else in a lighting scenario, then something is wrong. So, you know, what I mean is like these values, these color values are not that far off. And I'm not quite sure. So that kind of tells me that the lighting scenario is is just bizarre or something the brightness doesn't really do much for us um hmm Maybe it was global illumination. <laughs> that would make sense. Uh, 
So yes. Secondary bounces, cascade dances. Enables inter object reflections, which improves the quality of reflective surfaces. So I think that global the global illumination had a lot to do with it. Uh, however, well, actually, now you can see we're we're getting sort of getting that that bounce. I think the dirt mound might be a little too much now. Um. Maybe let's mess with our sky couple. I'm just cycling through these presets. That one isn't that bad. Oh no, it is. I don't like that how it I mean Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the gallery. This one isn't that far off either. See, I like the idea of uh, using something like Forest Path because, you know, that, that is naturally a setting that this asset would be in. Um, but it really comes down to how do you, I mean, like, how do you want to light it? You know, like this, this one works pretty well with the overall color here. And the only kind of complaint I have about this one would be uh, that the canopy is a little bit too much. So one thing, you know, actually maybe, maybe that's, we want to kind of like emphasize that green there. Um, also the, uh, gloss sorry the roughness on this guy I'm not liking too much well yeah I think it's the horizon smoothing it's kind of throwing it off so we're slowly starting to get oh, I think it's the... there <laughs> god I'm such an idiot Okay, so let me tell you guys what was happening. Uh, we that, that whole time, the uh, specular map intensity was turned up on this dirt mound and essentially was rendering this thing as a metallic object. And I was dumb and just didn't notice it until now. Um, so now probably what, what I can do is go back and use our regular base color map. Gosh, it's so, so dumb. I hate when that happens, when you're working and you're kind of like just, I don't know. I hope it makes you guys feel better that like everyone goes through this. Um, that's that's part of the reason why I include all, all, all this process crap. So uh, anyway, to recap, um, <laughs> the, the stupid intensity on the specular map was halfway up and it was giving this like shiny reflectiveness and we don't want that because this is dirt and there's no metal in dirt is there unless you're i don't know um near a volcano or something or uh i don't know isn't there there's like bits of metal in dirt Sometimes maybe I don't, but not not to that extreme, obviously. 
Okay, guys. Um, sorry, sorry. I feel like this one's kind of dragging on. Uh, but these are these minor tweaks that they all kind of come into play, and I just wanted to walk you guys through it. Uh, so you you know you can mess with this for hours and hours, and hopefully, what I've done here is I've Shine it, kind of shown you the basics of just plugging your stuff in um, and getting a getting like up and running up until this point you should be up and running <laughs> so um, another thing I we can do it, that's usually not too bad of an idea is to add more reflectivity into these this scene and um, what I can do is I'll include this. Uh, you can actually, you guys should watch this tutorial. I will pull it up for you right now. Um, it's called Substance Academy uh, Dirt Material. Let me see. Da -da -da -da. Here we go. Creating your first substance material. So uh, this entire thing is um it's through this tutorial right here and it's on substances uh website i highly recommend you go through this it's you will learn a ton um anyway so what we can do is put a water level node onto this guy and um that's going to effectively give us a uh, a roughness a, a nice reflectivity of of uh, this water these like water puddles and you can kind of change it dynamically sort of getting off topic here I apologize but I uh, the the moral of the story of this slightly tangent explanation is that <laughs> The more reflective bounces you can get into a render, the more visually interesting it will look. So, um, if I were to plug plug these outputs into these guys, metallic height. And then AO. Um, let's just, I just want to show you guys what it looks like really quick. So let's save this. This will all update in real time, so it's not like we're, we're having to re import everything. Uh, and I can, in, I'll include these water textures for you guys as well. Um, but, definitely go watch go watch that series it is great uh, okay so let's open up Marmoset now you can see we're now we're getting these like really cool uh, reflective water puddles in our texture here and we're starting to see like information um, from the environment onto these water puddles, uh, we might want to change like maybe the the clearness. I know that this node has that ability as well. Is um, water darkness, so we can kind of like pull that pull that down there, and then depth blur. Yeah, so let's try that. Um, I'm not, I don't think it would affect the normal. I think it would only affect your base color. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Oops, let's go back. So let's just, let's just update these really quick. Uh, this is another cool thing um, that I like to do is update all of my changes in real time. And 
you know, assuming you have all this stuff plugged in properly. Okay. Map. So, you know, now is the time we can start messing with that horizon smoothing and getting these really cool real time reflections. And you can see as I'm moving this, uh, Marmoset is rendering all of this stuff for me in real time. Um, I do, I do want to get rid of that really light brown look. I don't know why it's giving me that look. It doesn't quite look like that here. Um, maybe it's, uh, water, maybe the water darkness needs to be a little bit higher, actually. Maybe it, it doesn't need to be lighter. Maybe it needs to be higher. So like this, it's like sitting on this muddy, muddy ground and, you know, it just rained. Um, that's something. I'm just making sure that nothing in here is being weird. Um... We could try different lighting scenarios as well. I mean, you'll notice that a lot of things I've been doing in this video, I've just been kind of experimenting. Uh, this is kind of where I get lost, just having fun with this stuff. So I think you guys should get, get lost too. <laughs> it's cool, it's fun. Um, okay. I'm wasting time. I apologize. Let's leave it at, uh, at this guy for now. I changed my mind. How about that guy? Um, so let's say, you know, we, we get, we're happy. We're saying, wow, man, this is so freaking cool. Like, I don't even know. I don't even know what the heck you can you can clearly see that I'm actually not happy with this but for uh, argument's sake of not having this video go on for 10 years um, let's just say that I am so uh, what I'm gonna do now let's let's say that we have everything set up the way we like it we have tweaked all of our colors the way we like it and you know, you guys, because you guys are super hard workers, you've gone in and you've modeled grass and you've modeled little rocks and like you, you've built this enormous giant scene. Um, now you're ready for that final render. So uh, let's let's go through this. Um, so a couple things we want to do to set this up is uh, we're going to we're going to first and foremost let's go into render here and you can see that this resolution is set to one to one there's also this double two to one and literally all that does is it doubles the resolution um we're gonna leave this at one to one for now uh and then when we're ready to render our image, we're gonna set that to two to one. So um, you'll remember that we did enable global illumination. I was dumb and did not do that. Um, the few specular for all that. Uh, You can always mess with the voxel resolution. I don't usually touch this stuff. Um, however, I do want to make sure that this is kind of like your global ambient occlusion. And 
how much it affects. So you can see as I'm pulling the slider down, the context shadows between the tree and the uh, the dirt mound there um, are growing. So I kind of like to have that you know, towards the middle there, 0 0.09. Um, size, two-tone, that's fine. Uh, one thing you might you guys might want to do is you might want to throw in a couple of point lights um so the way you can do that is you can press new light and change the brightness um i will link you guys to a video i'll, sh I'll actually show you right now uh this video by tie dye is really really good it's called how to create professional looking renders using marmoset and photoshop definitely watch this uh I learned a ton from from this video and would highly recommend it. Um, so I'm giving tie dye a shout out there. Uh, essentially, what he says is to, you know, usually your you want to have like three lights in your scene, um, two lights towards the front here, something like that. Uh, obviously, I don't want a spotlight either. I think we want to we want to omni which is more like a point light and just something like that and then obviously we can bring that brightness down as well let's say it's like one let's maybe something like that three yeah maybe it's three and um so he also what he did was he duplicated another one. He kind of brought this this other one over towards the side here. Uh, it's an omni light, so it doesn't really matter which direction it's facing. Um, but he also had a kind of a backlight for your asset, something like that. And then he brought this one up here, and he tinted it blue. And I thought that was a really cool, nice little touch. So you can like tint this light a little bit to get like a blue. So you can kind of see that transition there between like a a regular light and a blue. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, let's go back to our sky. I uh, I'm trying to. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to turn this backdrop brightness down. And just because, like, it was really bright and kind of distracting. And then um, maybe turn that chat, that, uh, the brightness of the light or the sky down a little bit. And then maybe this comes down as well. Maybe it's a one. Same here, maybe that's one. Yeah, so uh, in that that tie-dye video I was telling you guys about, he he has this like backlight of blue, and he gets this nice nice reflections. And um, I thought that was a really good way to kind of accentuate your um, your canopies. So keep just keep that in mind. Uh, I will spend hours and hours in Marmoset just thinking of the perfect render, trying to get it. Um, I'm trying not to get too bogged down so that I can be efficient for you guys. Obviously, I think I failed at that in this video, but I am a perfectionist and I'm just trying to get the best possible view right now okay so yeah i mean that like let's say that we are happy with this and you know what i'm ready to i've got my lighting set up i've got my materials set up um one thing we should do is we should save this scene 
let's save this scene, you guys. Let's call this that. And then, um, cool. So let's go back to our render here. Let's uh, set that resolution to be double and watch this, ready? You can see automatically that aliasing gets removed. All of our curves are nice and sharp, provided that we want sharp curves. <laughs> Um, and, uh, it's looking good. I like it. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll bring this, this value down slightly. I don't know, something like that. I don't want, like, I don't want this to be overpowering. You know, I, I want to focus on the asset here. Um, so let's, uh, let's move into the main camera. Just making sure I'm not missing anything. Da, 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 da. This is fine. This is fine. Flare. Uh, one thing he did, tie dye did in his his video was he upped the chromatic aberration a little bit. I thought that was a cool touch. If you guys don't know what chromatic aberration, it's that like, um, kind of weird, uh, red outline you get when you're looking into the sun. It's kind of like a stylistic choice. I'm not super crazy about it, but like a little bit of it is fine. So you might want to bump that up slightly. I'm going to rotate this a little bit, maybe like that. And then let's go back to camera, depth of field. You guys can mess with this all day. I'm not going to mess with it right now. Tone mapping, um, this is similar to post-process stuff in Unreal, as you can see by post-effect. Uh, you can increase, you can have a vignette, so if I increase that, you can have something like this. I'm not going to do anything like that because we're just going to mess with that kind of stuff in Photoshop. Um, if you want green, you can add green. I don't really want green. So I'm, I'm pretty content with this. Uh, let's go into render and then there was one more thing that I wanted to do and that was to um, render this so it does not have a background and to be honest I forgot how to do that uh, mm. See, let me just look it up really quick. Uh, uh, document settings so maybe it's edit preferences no, 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 no. Uh, I <laughs> I always get I always get stuck on this part and it's really annoying um Capture settings. Okay, format transparency. Saves the transparency mask into the alpha channel of the exported image where supported. So hit that. And sure. 1920 by 1080. That's plenty big for what we're going to be doing. Um, yeah. Okay. So. What that was was under capture settings and then transparency. Um, so let's go ahead and let's hit, let's go back and hit, let's say this is like, you know, the view we want right now. Let's hit capture image. And that's going to take not that long, apparently. And here's our screenshot. Nice. Cool. Let's get one more view. Um, oh, that's cool. I like that blue kind of casting a shadow right there. 
uh, but it might be somewhat inconsistent. Let's move it. Oops. Let's, oh, let's move it um, this way a little bit. Yeah, let's move it like across like that. And then let's take these guys and move them to the other side, like so. So that's cool, right there. So let's say we like we like this view right here. Let's capture this one as well. Capture image. And uh, I set it to output to my desktop. So you can go to capture settings and then not in here. Capture show output folder. Um, that'll tell you where where it goes. Okay. Um, I want to do one more thing before we go into Photoshop and start compositing this stuff. Uh, I want to render a wireframe and that's because I want people to see that we can make assets with clean topology and if we're handing this off to like a world building team or something and they need to edit it really quickly that that's totally possible and the only way we can show that is through a wireframe. So um, what I'm going to do really quick is I'm going to save this and then I'm going to save another copy of this scene and call it 01 ponytail palm underscore WF for wireframe and that's because I need to apply the same material to all this stuff. So I'm going to drag this default material and this is why I didn't delete it um, onto each of our each of our components here and uh, I'm gonna turn our gloss down so that it's not shiny at all um, I'm going to go to render and then there's this nice little button here called wireframe and you can see that you can't see anything so let's let's change that color to a black and right now we're getting kind of this pretty clearly visible wireframe view of our model. Um, controls the intensity of the wireframe effect. So if I pull that up, I want this to be as clear as possible. And um, honestly, I don't think we would need any type of lighting information for this. So I'm going to turn off all of my lights. And that's... That's a pretty clean wireframe flat render right there. Uh, I'm also wondering if I could even just like, can I go to two? Yeah, you can. So you can you can go all the way up to like, I don't know. Let's type in fifty for. Okay, that actually might not do anything. <laughs> so it does default back to one. Um, that's okay because we can edit this crunchiness in Photoshop. Um, it's still not quite flat enough because I can see some shadow information in here. Uh, and I think I know where that's coming from. I think that's coming from our ambient occlusion. So let's turn that off. And then let's also turn off GI. Oh, maybe we don't want to do that. Specular diffuse. No, no. There we go. It was secondary bounces. Adds. The effect of multiple bounces. So we we just want light to bounce once, essentially. Um, and this is a good wireframe render right here. And it is going to match exactly the position and scale of our last render, right? So um, and that's for clarity's sake. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we jump into Photoshop. So let's capture that image. Okay. Cool. And for now, I would say we are done in Marmoset. I have my three shots right here. And you can see that if I flip between these two, they're the same exact view, just one is wireframe and one has all of our materials on it. And that's all I meant um, when I meant for clarity's sake. Because uh, you can quickly kind of jump back and forth between the two. So. 
anyway, um, let's let's do this. Let's jump into Photoshop. Uh, in tie dye's video, he also goes over this type of stuff um, as well with compositing a uh, you know portfolio ready sheet for your um, asset and I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys uh, a couple of of um, of uh, examples that I found on ArtStation that pretty it, they inspired me a lot and um, for different reasons so this first one and this is just how to you know how are you gonna present this on your part portfolio uh this is my old pal justin kimball just kidding he's not he's not my old pal but he did follow me so i was pretty proud of that this is from uh, days gone he did all the foliage in days gone and it's just absolutely beautiful um i love it and the reason why is uh that i'm showing you guys this is just it's kind of a cool way to show off your work he calls these um foliage vignettes and you can see that he has his kind of main asset here and all of his shrubs at the bottom and kind of scatters them around and i'm assuming how this worked was each of these like clumps of vegetation were a set that he delivered to his uh his world building team and then they use these assets to kind of paint the the landscape in in that game so uh this is one way um you can present your foliage and this is absolutely amazing and uh um also this is assuming you know that you made several types of vegetation i did do that um but for the sake of this tutorial i also pulled up some other examples showing just cool ways to present just one asset um this art station is tyler smith at sucker punch and i i really like this tree uh it says he did it in mayan zbrush with renders as we can see this is one way he presents his um his uh uh geometry topology um, I, I think for, you know, just my taste of showing off wireframes, I like to have a wireframe just overlaid on the, on a white mesh so that it's clear. My topology is clear to the viewer, but you know, this method is totally cool too. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I, that I was talking about. And then another one. This would this would be an example of showing off, you know, just what I was just talking about, uh, topology versus fully rendered views. Um, this is Eric McKinney. So uh, you know, go onto ArtStation and just kind of look around, and you know, all I did was type in foliage, and um, got some pretty cool results. If my internet would work. But clearly it's not going to. So, uh, anyway, um, let's jump into Photoshop. Let's go to File, New. Um, I typically present all of my renders of my environments at 1920 by 1080. And I think for now I'm just going to stick with that format. So I'm going to just do a 1920 by 1080. And then let's hit create. Okay. Um, tie dye goes through a nice format that he uses for his Photoshop uh, process here. And I'm just jumping to a couple timestamps. So this is. You know, he's rendered out two um, images here, and he has, like, a nice backdrop overlay with a couple subtle effects. And, again, like, really watch this tutorial because uh, 
he, he gave me a lot of ideas that I would have never thought of. <laughs> so, um, and that's partly why I pulled these guys up just so, you know, like there's, there's really no wrong way to present this stuff. As long as it's clear to the viewer and you guys are happy with it, then that's what I think is most important. Like you want everything to be visible. Uh, so let's start building our doodad. Uh, let's first open our images, and those are our three screenshots here. Okay, um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name this layer 01 underscore ponytail palm WF for wireframe. Uh, oh, you know what I forgot to do is I forgot to turn off the chromatic aberration for this wireframe. So let me um, go back really quick. Let me turn that off. I think that's a main camera. Where are you? There you are. Let's turn it to zero. There we go. That's more flat now. Let's capture that image. And it is this one and not this one. So, nope. Photoshop open let's go to uh there we go um that's better let's go to on ponytail palm wireframe and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to image adjustments brightness and i'm just going to bump this contrast up so that it's very clear to the viewer of our wireframe and i know it's kind of hard to see right now because we're on a a background list background but um, once we get it on top of a color it'll be more clear so back to our main file here let's just create a quick background um, i liked tie-dye's uh, approach here making it like a soft gray and um, uh, let's call this just background. And then let's add kind of like top bars. Or let's just call this bars. And then what he did was, honestly, I. It's been a while since I watched it, but he, uh, what did he do? So he, yeah. Oh, okay. I see. So he had a, he had a darker background on the, on the back and then, um, just kind of made a, a square rectangle and centered it in the middle. So. Let's say that let's say that this one is our uh, square and obviously like I don't wanna we don't wanna copy tie dye completely, but um, I'm going to I mean like this is just it's a nice way of of uh, grounding your scene, grounding your presentation here, something like that. Um, so just want to make sure that yeah. So this is kind of the the basic uh, idea of his video, and. Um, you know, I think I think it's nice. It it's a really simple way to present an asset, and um, just it's not it's not busy or anything. It's just it grounds it, and um, yeah. So I think a lot of a lot of art is looking to other artists to see how they do their stuff, and then kind of making it your own. So let's. Let's just do that. Um, 
let's go to uh, let's call this first render O1 ponytail palm one, and then let's just drag him in like so, something like that, and we'll we'll resize him in a bit. Uh, I can already see that this guy is much darker than the other one, so we might need to do a little bit of work on that, but let's do ponytail palm two. Let's bring him in like that. Um, and then we already have our wireframe, so let's uh, bring him in. Cool. So uh, the way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to kind of break this sheet apart into one main render and then two kind of secondary renders and these two secondary renders um, since they both match with wireframe overlays if that makes sense like this this view is the same as this view this one is just a wireframe I'm gonna make these two my secondary renders so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just control T and kind of stretch that down slightly, something like this. And then uh, my wireframe, I will do this, maybe something like that. Uh, and then my, my main render, I don't like how bright it is in comparison to this guy, so I might brighten this guy up a little bit. Um, but I think he is good where he's at. Actually, let's, let's make him a little bit smaller because I do want room for text right here just to show like what, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, okay. Uh, let's make him a little bit smaller just to show that he is indeed our secondary. So, you know, the, the main idea I'm going for here is that we have one kind of hero render and then we have two informative renders. And, and um, it's clear what is what. Uh, so let's go to two and then let me just do like an I don't think this is gonna work but let's try auto tone okay yeah that's not too bad actually might be a little too much on the green but let's do a uh, let's add a um, let's add a layer here let's call this contrast and then let's add an effects and then do a uh, blending options. No. Uh, you know what I want to do? I just want to mess with this individually for now. Let's bring up the brightness slightly. Bring down the contrast a little bit. Something like that. And then um, for my main guy, he's a little too bright I might want to bring him down just just a smidge okay um, here we go okay so I made one called an empty layer called contrast. Let's go down to create new fill or adjustment layer. And this isn't even gonna matter that I made this, but let's go to brightness and contrast. So this can affect the whole canvas essentially. Um, I'm just making like little tweaks here and there. And if we don't want our wireframe to be affected by that, we can just pull it up above, but I think it's okay. 
Um, cool. And then, um, again, this kind of gets gets into the fact of, uh, you know, like, for the purposes of this of this video, I'm not going to spend hours and hours on this, but normally I would do that. Uh, but um, there's just a couple of minor little effects that we can do to make these things pop, these renders pop. So let's do a, let's see what a drop shadow looks like on this guy. So I went to effects and I went to drop shadow. Actually, let's do this first one. Effects, drop shadow. That looks pretty good, don't you think? Let's um, pull him the spread down. Maybe the spread, yeah. Let's do distance. So it kind of gives that like fake, fake uh, depth to that scene or to that render. It's kind of cool. Pops off the page a little bit. Uh, you can actually hold Alt if you want to copy these effects. Hold Alt and just drag them like so. So now that we got a little bit of depth to our scene, or our, our model sheet here, and that's not bad. Let's maybe pull him up a little bit. And I want to pull him over slightly. Something like that. Okay, um, so a good model sheet, uh, when you're presenting something like a game asset, uh, would have information about that model and who the artist is, what what the you know poly count is, stuff like that. So I think um, you should add people, you know, we should add uh, something like that. So what I'm envisioning is we use this bottom bar here and I I think I think tie-dye does this. I'm not sure. I, I think he just does his signature, but um, what I think we should do also I might want to like just bring that down a little bit. Alt, delete. I wonder if you could add like a drop. No, that wouldn't do anything. What if you added it to to that? See, that's that's kind of interesting. These drop shadows here. Um, I guess you would have to to duplicate this layer if you wanted them both. Um, and then. Control T, Shift, and then. Oh no, that's not how it works, is it? <laughs> uh, I was just thinking you can get this type of effect on both, both uh, bars here, but you know, I, I think that might end up being a little bit too noisy. So, um, you know, just kind of experiment with it. But let's um, let's add some text. So. I'm going to click the text button here. Uh, I think I want my text to be... I don't know. Let's start off with black. And then... Um, I'm looking for the perfect text. I think it was Lucida was one of my favorites. Yeah, Lucida Sands. Um, so I'm gonna drag out a text box. Um, let's change this point to uh, uh, 50, da da da, cool, uh, 50, let's, let's do this like half that size, yeah, that's plenty, actually, I, uh, 
bear with me for a second. I have a font that I really liked. I just don't remember what I chose. I thought it was Lucida. Um, Photoshop. So this was an example. This is an example of a previous plant I was doing. Um, so Lucida console. Okay, that's right. Okay. Um, I'm all messed up here. So delete, delete. Let's start a new one. Right there. Let's change you to console. Lucida console. There you go. Let's hit backspace. And then um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to name my asset right now. So this this would be kind of like our title card. So let's call it ponytail palm tree. And then let's pull him down. I want him like, I want the font just kind of resting right there. Um, I'm going to change the color or the opacity in a second, but let's, uh, let's duplicate this layer and then pull him down like so. And then, um, let's bring our text back, text box back. And then let's say, uh, Polly's. tries and then police tries that have quads oh sorry vertices <laughs> I'm dumb yes vert vert count is very Im important. <laughs> So, uh, Polly's tries verts, and you just basically what we're doing is we're telling the viewer, hey, this is exactly how this is our oops, this is our topology here, and this is the information on the topology, right? Um, of course, we are obligated now to give them that information. So let's go back. Let's select this. This is where this comes in handy. So 2076 polys is what we have. 2076 and then 4045. Oh wait, that was vertices, wasn't it? No, that was tries. Why am I blind? What is happening? Okay, 4,000. And I already forgot, what was it? 45. And then vertices, we have 2,502. Cool. And then let's give that a space right there. Okay. Um, so I don't like this super harsh black right here. And so what I might do is just bump the opacity of this layer down. Let's see what 50%, yeah, let's, let's try 75. Let's say that's fine for now. Let's try this, oh wait, sorry. Let's try this at 75. And that might be maybe 80. Okay, I mean, we can come back to this, but setting up this text is good. Um, let's make another text box. And then we want the viewer to know who made this model. So what I usually do is I put my email. And then right there, 
and then um, yeah my art station so you can put your email or whatever way it there that this employer or whoever you're presenting this to is going to contact you through um, and then uh, your art station and you know that that's usually for the purpose of like I don't know someone reposts your work and then they don't know who did that work and they really liked it but you know how are they supposed to find you so um, so I've gotten into the habit of having the link of my art station on all of my uh, environment shots and and asset renders um, and then uh, if this were if you were doing this for a game uh, you know you could have you could scoot this up a little bit and then put your games logo right here um, this was one that I'm this is what I'm doing for Pavor uh, that's this game's hopefully gonna be released pretty soon um, so yeah, you know, just just kind of keep that stuff in mind while you're while you're doing this. Um, one other thing we might be able to do here is add a vignette, and he goes over that too. Um, forgot how to do that in Photoshop. But essentially, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we can come back to that. No worries. Let's let's get all of our text in order first. Getting ahead of myself. Cool. Um, let's pull these guys up slightly. Uh, no, I think it should be in line with this. I come from architecture, so this kind of laying out stuff is really nitpicky. Um, okay. So, uh, one more thing that we might want to do that I think is actually really um, useful when you're doing a model sheet like this is giving, inputting a silhouette of a human to show how large your your asset is in comparison to you know a human um, I've made one already and I just I this was I think this was like a silhouette of Joel from the last of us um, but all I did was I just brought that picture of him in and I selected the outline and then I filled it with white bump the opacity down really, really low because I don't want him to be overpowering this uh, asset. And then I just added like a really simple drop shadow to him. So um, this this one might not work for what we need it to because of the background, but let's just make our... So this should actually be called background. And then this should be called bars. And in reality, we might want to have the background to be darker gray. Uh, did that not do anything? Alt, delete. It didn't do anything. OK, why? Why did it not do anything? Disable, no. Oh, I think I can just, yeah, there we go. Drag that to the trash can. And now let's try it. Alt delete, there we go, okay. So obviously not that dark. Let's make it like the same tone as here. And then um, let's make these, dark, these bars darker. 
And now what we can do for our text is we can actually make these a little bit lighter. So maybe these actually become white. Yeah. And then same thing here. Where are you at? There you go. White and then white and then one more okay now uh, let's get this silhouette to look right um, so I'm just gonna kind of place him on our secondary render and then I think he's about something like that in comparison. So I don't know. I think that that's a nice little detail that uh, you can you can do for kind of larger assets, like you know if you're making a a building or something. Um, it's nice to to show how large that is in comparison to the player. Um, it gives it gives an idea as to why you gave or why you modeled it the way you modeled it, if that makes sense. Like if this tree were enormous, it would make more sense for us to have more geometry and it wouldn't, you know, the whoever's looking at it understands, okay, yeah, if this tree is four stories tall, I can understand why he needs, um, 4,000 polygons and 8,000 tries or whatever. So that's uh, my two cents on that. And um, you know what, you guys, I this is uh, this is we're kind of coming to the end here. Um, the rest are, is just like, how do you want to dress this up? How do you want to make things pop? How do you want to accent stuff? Um, I know tie dye in his video he had these like these dust particles that he did uh and I thought that was kind of cool so like you know if we just do something like that um it adds sort of a you know it's very subtle but there's like little dust particles around there um and yeah, uh, at the <laughs> at the end of this, I, I think that this this asset came out really well. And um, wow, it's weird. I'm just I'm just ending this right now. So uh, I apologize if this video has been run on, but I think that's it. Um, you know, at the at the very end of this. Uh, you know, you want to dress up your model sheet however you want. Um, you should be exporting this. You should not be saving these as. You should be exporting them as PNGs or, you know, whatever. I, I'm pretty sure uh, if you're exporting out of Photoshop, PNG is going to be your best bet as far as resolution goes. But... Um, the the best the largest sheet to post on ArtStation to retain that level of quality is going to be this size here, 1920 by 1080. And if you just hit export all and call this 01 underscore ponytail palm, and you hit save, you're done. And then um, you can post this on ArtStation, and then everyone can say how how awesome it looks and you can be like wow thanks guys that's that's really cool of you to say <laughs> but um yeah sorry guys i know that this this whole tutorial series has been a little rough around the edges but thank you for you know going through it with me uh if if this goes well i'll definitely think about making some more um, I have a couple of ideas of what I would want to show you guys next. 
Um, but you know, above all, I just I really hope that some of this or something out of this series was helpful for you. Um, I I had never done foliage up until like six months ago, maybe a little more, eight months or something. And um, you know, the the best way to do it is is just practice. You know, just keep making stuff and uh, sign up for, you know, if you can't afford um, traditional courses at a university, online courses are a huge help. Um, I am not formally trained in game art, so I, all of this stuff I learned on my own, and, um, you know, you guys can do it too, so... Again, um, thank you guys for, for watching this. I hope it, it was useful. Uh, go ahead and, you know, send me an email. Let me know if you have any questions, if you want to say hi. Follow me on ArtStation. I'll follow you guys back. Um, and with that, I will see you in the next tutorial. <sighs> Goodbye.